Huawei Siligurki ist hier auf dem gratis erreichbaren Microserver server Let's Go äh, mit der Domain siligurki.com alternativ erreichbar unter der IP 149.202.137.134 ähm, und ich sollte echt mal irgendwie aufhören, das asynchron zu schreiben und zu sagen. Ähm, ja, jedenfalls ist das hier ein Microsoft-Server ohne Regeln und das ist hier sozusagen ein Werbevideo dafür. Also, bitte doch mal diesem Server bei. Ähm, ja, soweit eigentlich zur Info bezüglich des Servers. 20 Slots geplant, äh, noch einige Jahre online zu bleiben oder so lange, wie ich es halt schaffe. Ähm, genau, und wir schauen heute ein Media CCC.de Video vom offiziellen Chaos Computer Club von der 35C3 äh, den Wallet.fail Talk von 2018 an. Ähm, von we wer da jetzt genau spricht, weiß ich nicht. Ich will doch immer gern die Autoren Menschen äh, Thomas Roth, Dimitri Neodowski, Joss Datko, vielleicht sind die das, keine Ahnung. Ähm, I don't know. Also, die werden sich wahrscheinlich eh gleich selber vorstellen, die werden davon nichts hören. Link wie immer in der Beschreibung zum Video und auch die IP von dem Microsoft Server. Let's go! Welcome everybody to our next talk. It's the talk of all As you all know, when you have something valuable, you put it somewhere safe. But as we as hackers also know, there's no place that is really safe. And our three speakers, Thomas, Dimitri and Josh, are now going to demonstrate in the next hour the art of completely breaking something apart. So please give a big round of applause for Thomas, Dimitri and Josh and have a lot of fun. So just to, just to start, I'm okay, curious how many people nice. here actually own cryptocurrency. Raise your hand. And how many of you store it on a hardware wallet? So we're very sorry to everyone who, who has their, their hand up. Okay, so it's not just me, it's uh, me, Josh, and Thomas. Uh, so we're all hardware people. We do low-level hardware stuff in varying degrees. Uh, and we got into cryptocurrency and so nee, I schlecht. recommend to everyone sitting in this room if you're a security person uh, there's not a lot of people doing security in cryptocurrency as much as that's painful to hear so uh, yeah I mean a lot of this is based on reverse engineering uh, we love cryptocurrency I mean for us crypto also stands for cryptography not just cryptocurrency uh, but no offense to, to anyone uh, with this talk, it's just something that, it's a category that we looked at, and so the results uh, kind of speak for themselves. And again, this wouldn't be possible alone, so we have a lot of people to thank. I'm not gonna go through all of them individually, uh, just be known that we're thankful to everyone on this on this slide. Uh, so yeah, so we started this about six months ago. Uh, so we, w we wanted to take a look at cryptocurrency because we own some cryptocurrency ourselves uh, and we saw that everyone's using uh, cryptocurrency wallets. It's more and more the thing that you do. So we started a group chat as you do nowadays uh, and we have 50,000 messages now and uh, 1,100 images and I had my first Uh, I had my son in the meantime as well, so it's a really long time that we spend looking at this, uh, etc. <laughs> These random sun okay. drop note. So what do we want to achieve though? Because people don't give uh, the kinds of attacks that you can actually perform against uh, cryptocurrency wallets and of credit. So first attack is supply chain attacks, where you uh, are able to manipulate the devices before they get to the end customer. Firmware vulnerabilities, where you find a vulnerability in the firmware and can somehow either infect or do something something else with the device. Side channel attacks, of course, uh, I think that's one of the more obvious ones that people are familiar with. And also chip level vulnerabilities. So we were able to find uh, one of each of these, and so that's the talk. We're going to talk about each one of these uh, individually. So, but first, what's a what's a wallet? Just in case you are not uh, 100% familiar with them. So a wallet and in general cryptocurrency, how do you do this? It's just asymmetric cryptography. So you have a private key and a public key. Uh, the public key, basically, it gives you the address. You can derive the address from this. The address is nothing other than the public key of the wallet. And you have the private key, and you need this to send uh, transactions, so to actually operate with the cryptocurrency. So 
This, the private key is what needs to be kept secret. The public key is something that everyone can know so that they can send cryptocurrency to you. But it kind of sucks to have a uh, separate for each cryptocurrency pair or for each wallet, maybe you want multiple wallets. It sucks to generate a new, a new, a new uh, cryptographic pair for each one of them. So uh, the people, the wonderful people behind Bitcoin have thought of something for this and it's uh, called Bit32, Bit44. Uh, and so what it is, is you have a cryptographic seed and you can actually derive um, the, the, the accounts from, from a single seed. So you basically store one seed and you're able to uh, implement and do uh, unlimited amount of wallets, okay? So basically you do key derivation, <coughs> as data, do key derivation, and you can have an unlimited amount of wallets while storing a single seed. And this is what you're using when you're using a, a hardware wallet. So, and of course, for, for each key derivation, there will be a new private key and a public key, but it'll be generated in a predictable manner, and you only need to store one secret seed. So you only have to store the seed. You can write it down, and that's the advantage. But it's difficult to write down because it's binary data. So come bit 39, which is what you're most used to, which is a format in which you can take that cryptographic seed, that binary data, and actually convert it to a set of dictionary words that you can then easily write down on a piece of paper and store it at your mother's house or store half of it at your mother's house and half of it at your grandmother's house. Uh, and that way somebody would have to go into both houses simultaneously to get your words. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so what's a hardware Seven wallet? Seven um, so you sleep. Talk about what's a wallet. So this why one, do you even yeah. need a hardware wallet? Well, the problem is, uh, of course, computers can get backdoored, uh, have malware running on them, and this is what you want to prevent against. How do you do this? You have a secure device, you store your seed externally, Usually this is a USB connected device uh, that you store your, your crypto on. And so you can trust this uh, even if you can't trust your computer is the idea. So what happens is the computer sends the transaction to the device. The device gets the transaction. It can actually confirm or deny the transaction. It also displays the transaction. So before you do any cryptographic signing, you can see, is that actually what I was doing or was my computer owned and is it initiating the transaction for me? So you sign the transaction uh, and the, also, yeah, the seed never leaves the transaction, but the hardware signs the transaction for you. You send it back to the computer, and the computer can actually take that and send it to uh, the internet. Okay, so that's the quick rundown of how uh, crypto, or sorry, how hardware wallets work. So the first thing that we looked at was supply chain attacks, which is where Josh can pick up. You have a mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> talking about stickers today, they're, they're for laptop decorations, they're not for security. Uh, supply chain tasks are easy to perform, but they're quite hard to perform at scale. And the last takeaway that I have to leave you with is that the vendor threat model may not actually be your threat model. So security stickers, uh, so some of the wallet vendors are using them, I have seen them on other products, they seem to be quite popular. Uh, I have a friend and colleague named Joe Fitzpatrick. He also likes the, run FPS uh, so the stickers that he makes are the same as we find on a security product. They have holograms, they have unique serial numbers, and they leave you with that nice, warm, fuzzy security feeling. And so Joe makes some funny ones. Uh, you can get a FITS 140 F2 uh, proof stickers. You don't have to pay all the money for the FITS one, just get the FITS one. So, the first uh, device that I looked at was the Treasure One. The Treasure One actually has two levels of protection on the uh, packaging. There's the hologram sticker, and the actual box is uh, enclosed with a, with a empty suit. So it's supposed to be that you actually have to rip open the box to get into it. But if you use a hot air gun or a hair dryer, it's actually quite easy to remove. And so if you see on the left there, uh, that's the original package, and on the right, uh, this is the box that I have opened and put everything back into. And if you look closely, there is a little bit of uh, gap there. The sticker has a little bit of break, but this was a first try and it's pretty close. So trust me, taking a sticker off is not very really hard. Now, if you remember this picture of the sticker, so we're going to come back to it. So, But for the vendor, it, this is actually a real problem. So Trezor did put a blog post out. That's one of the challenges they face is that they're facing counterfeiting of their devices. So this is from their blog post. They say, hey, you know, we've noticed that there's counterfeit devices. You have to look at the stickers to see that they're legit. So I said, remember, I'll look at that sticker. So I bought that case about a year and a half ago for my previous DEFCON talk. And it's the same sticker that they're saying is fake here. So uh, then on their wiki, it's very confusing because 
those three sets of stickers. So basically, yeah, stickers are very confusing. They cause problems for end users. And I was not even sure if I bought a real printer or a cloning. So this morning, I got out a, a new case. And just to make sure, I took off the sticker uh, using very sophisticated equipment, including a very expensive Dyson uh, hair dryer that was included in the Airbnb. And I was able to remove the sticker. So uh, it comes off without any zero residue, without with zero residue. So yes, stickers do not provide any security. On the Trezor T, they switched it from the box, so now the box can be opened easily. But now there's a sticker on the USB-C port. Again, as you would expect, you use hot air and you can easily remove it. Pro tip, don't set the hot air rework that high. I had it set for lead-free reworking and I actually melted the enclosure. So if you're going to do this kind of supply chain attack, maybe you know, set the heat a little lower. But if you just Google how to remove stickers, the same uh, attack method works. So, uh, so this causes a bit of confusion because the ledger uh, device has a very, uh, I will say, in your face uh, piece of paper when you open the box that says there are no stickers in this box. However, I combed through about 250 one-star Amazon reviews and a lot of them have to do with confusion about the stickers. So some of them are actually quite funny. Uh, so this, is, this one started out and built the wall hazard. So I was really into it. So I was like, okay, I pro tip what this guy has to say. And uh, basically, he was complaining that there was fingerprints on the device. So that's how he used the attack. Um, another one complained that uh, the fingerprints were on the wall and there was a hair underneath. So if you're doing supply chain attacks, be sure to remove any evidence of the fingerprints or the hair. So, Anyway, stickers don't work. That's all I want to say about that. Um, once you get through this enclosure, though, you then have to have the challenge of actually opening the enclosure. These are three different wallet devices, Ledger Nano on the left, the Trezor 1, and the Trezor T on the bottom, all of which actually open pretty easily. So the Trezor uh, 1, even, so this, I'm still not sure if that's the counterfeit of the real one, but I get on the, re on the real one today, I was able to pop open the enclosure. So it is ultrasonically welded, but you can pry it in there and open it. The Ledger Nano opens very easily, like without any equipment. But once you do this, you know, what do you do once it's opened? So the attack basically is you take the microcontroller and you rework it. So you remove the microcontroller from the printed circuit board and you put on a new one that you bought from a distributor. Once you've done that on the Trezor devices, you can put your compromised bootloader on there. So this is, I did not go as far to make the compromised bootloader, but I did confirm that once I switch the microcontroller, I can connect with a debugger over a, a FWD and I have free access to the chip. So some of the parts got blown off when I was reworking, but that can sometimes. So yeah, so you just rework, reflash, and then you put everything back together. So next I want to talk about hardware implants. So you may remember the story that came out, they were they passed by Bloomberg about hardware implants. I wanted to make a hardware implant. I also wanted to have a little bit of fun with this. So we, uh, in the honor of the Bloomberg story, uh, which has some, uh, you know, may have some issues with it, I, we're about to talk about the Bloom Burglar, which is a uh, super micro fun implant. So the goal for this implant is I wanted this implant to happen after a receipt. So it, it's both a supply chain attack and a physical one. Like a red team can perform this, a, a malicious insider could also perform this attack. Zero firmware because it's not fun. Uh, it has to fit inside of the hardware wall, so it has to be small. It has to also bypass a core security function, otherwise it's not an implant. Very few components. I, I have a thousand of them with me. So I wanted to be able to, for the makers and the DIYers that participate in the hardware implant fund. So, what kind of implant did I end up with? Well, I decided to do a basically RF triggered switch. And so the idea is on these devices, there's a button. And the button is the last line of defense. So all the vendors assume that the host is going to be compromised. They just assume that's going to be easy because that's software. And so once you have a compromised host, you have to point to the device and then the human so humans are still needed. Uh, humans have to look at it and say, is this the right transaction or not? They have to say yes or no. So now with this implant, I can, through RF, I can trigger the yes button. So a human is not required to send transactions, I can remotely trigger it. Basically the RF comes in through the antenna, it goes through a single transistor, which is the main component, and it pulls the button off. And I'm sorry to say that the bill of materials is quite expensive, at $3.16. $2.61 of that is this uh, potentiometer I had to use. So it's a, it's a little bit expensive, I'm sorry. Uh, also, why is this so big? I mean, this is an American dime. I can put two on them. What's the deal? Why is it so big? 
Well, I optimize it for Canvas anyway, so uh, it would be even more fun to do. But I'm basically put the antenna in, and then there's an out button, and look at the uh, that. So just for scale, this is how it fits on the Lego Nano. This is how it fits on the Tresor. Uh, it is also, because Fred works friendly with the thing, they made it Fred work friendly. So you can also play along very easily. So then the last challenge with an RF implant is how do you design an antenna to fit in there? And so the big thing there with an SMA connector is the first prototype I did. Experimented with a few antenna designs, but the, remember it all has to fit inside the Ledger. So that's actually quite easy because the Ledger Nano has plenty of room uh, to insert extra... Uh okay, wir machen hier mal einen kurzen Cut, weil meine FPS sind echt am Sack irgendwie, oder? Gehen die wieder? Nee, also irgendwas, irgendwas arbeitet hier, da muss ich kurz mal schauen. Ähm, Genau, wir sehen uns in der, in der nächsten Folge. Das ist jetzt so eine Zwei-Part-Folge.